Yes, hello, this is Katrina, and I'm going to talk about John Maysfield's Sea Fever. He wrote this poem in 1902, and the music you heard initially is Dream Children by Edward Elgar, and that was written in 1902 as well. John Maysfield is British, and he was born in 1878 and died in 1967. So he wrote the poem when he was 24, and in the picture you see there, uh, he was probably around about 24. And he became Poet Laureate in 1930, so 28 years after he wrote this a poem which became very famous and is famous until today. I'm going to run through his biography just very briefly and in so far as it is relevant to the poem. Um, he was at Warwick Public School and he did not enjoy it there at all and so he left and boarded the HMS Conway at the age of only 13 and wanted to train for a life at sea and to break his addiction to reading of which his aunt thought little. But that backfired because Actually, on a ship, he had quite a bit of time for reading and writing, and so this actually reinforced his desire to become a writer, and as his love for storytelling grew, and while on the ship, he listened to the stories told about sea law, and throughout his life, he wrote a lot about the sea, we're now going to listen to the poem, read by Tom O'Bedlam. Sea Fever by John Macefield I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea in the sky, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by, and the wheels cake and the wind's song and the white sails shaking, and a grey mist on the sea's face and a grey dawn breaking. I must go down to the seas again, for the call of the running tide is a wild call and a clear call that may not be denied. And all I ask is a windy day, with the white clouds flying, and the flung spray, and the blown spume, and the seagulls crying. I must go down to the seas again, to the vagrant gypsy life, to the gull's way and the whale's way, where the wind's like a wetted knife. And all I ask is a merry yarn from a laughing fellow rover, and quiet sleep and a sweet dream when the long trick's over. At the bottom of the page you can see a few words which might or might not be difficult. Particular attention should probably be paid to the third last word, trick. It can mean many things, and is certainly ambiguous in the poem, it can be, on the literal level, a sailor's turn at the helm, usually lasting for two or four hours, but it can also mean an illusion. Now I'm going to summarise the poem. So in his poem, Sea Fever, published in 1902, John Maysfield celebrates sailing. The poetic persona wants to go down to the ocean once more in order to steer a sailing ship. He hopes that the weather will be harsh, strong wind, high waves, a grey sky and fast-moving clouds. And he hopes to hear the sound of the waves and the wind and to follow the paths of seagulls and whales. He also wants to feel the sharp wind, listen to the stories of another sailor or traveller and sleep and dream well after long duty at the steering wheel. As far as the main idea is concerned, the poem can be read on several levels. There's the most obvious level, and on this most obvious level, the poem celebrates sailing. On the second level, it reflects life, so the different stages of life, youth, adulthood, and old age. And on the third level, it depicts the process of writing. 
So it's a very multi-layered poem, and that's what makes it so interesting, because when you read it, you sense all these different layers at the same time, and that makes it very attractive, like a shining diamond. So, as far as the celebration of sailing goes, it can be stated that the rhythm is extremely irregular, and this reflects the rough movement of a stormy sea he yearns for. So, for instance, in the first line we have, I must down to the seas again, to the lonely sea and the sky. So that's the first line. We have an iambic rhythm, so that's a very classical rhythm at first, but then halfway through, it shifts to the anapest and then back to the I am and back to the anapest. After that, we have an all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. Now we have two I ams again and then a pyrrhic, so two unstressed syllables, a spondy, uh, two stressed syllables, and then shifting back into the iambic rhythm again. In the next line, and the wheels kick, and the winds song, and the white sails shaking. So there we have the pyrrhic, the spondy, pyrrhic, spondy, and the anapest, and an iamb. So that's very irregular, and he likes this uh, to alternate the pyrrhic and the spondy, which obviously reflects this very da 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 the sea sort of moving back and forth. Then we have personification. So the personification of the ship and the sea, as well as of the sea animals, impart a sense of unity between the speaker and his ship on the one hand and the sea on the other hand. So personification also serves to celebrate sailing here. I marked all uh, the instances of personification. Um, there are loads of them, as you can see. And so we have the lonely sea, we have to steer her by. A ship's often referred to as she, uh, but here it obviously reinforces the, the personification. And then we have the wheels kick and the wind's song the wide sails shaking. The sea's even got a face here, so that's a, a strong personification because the face is very particular to, to humans. So then we have the call of the running tide, two personifications here. In the second half of the line, you see the the tide running, so either towards us or away from us. Um, and then we have as a wild call and a clear call, uh, the call of the sea. So it has this wild aspect of a natural call. It's also clear to the poetic persona. And then we have the water flinging spray and blowing spumes. So that's something human beings do, blowing and flinging things. And the seagulls cry, so again, personification. We have the gull's way, the whale's way. Um, normally, mm, we have ways in the human world, uh, not in the sea, so that's another personification. So as far as the reflection of life goes, we have the different stages of life being depicted. So in the very first stanza, we have youth. So the poetic persona wants a tall ship and a star to steer her by, so that's his means of transport through life. Then we have a grey mist on the sea's face. So the idea of the future not being clear, it's, it's still in the mist, right? A young person doesn't know what the future will bring. And then we have a grey dawn breaking, so the beginning of a day can be likened to the beginning of life. Adulthood, so that's 
the stormy time of life when you have to face challenges and you follow your calling so in this case the sea seems to be the calling so a wild call and a clear call is what you what you hear inside you concerning the path you should follow life right then we have maturity so when you know your way around as it were on the path you've picked so you know oh that's the gull's way and that's the whale's way so you you know this life by now the last two lines then we have on the last line we have quiet sleep and a sweet dream when the long trick's over so that we have the poetic persona calming down after all the agitation and the challenges so we have quiet sleep a sweet dream when the long tricks over so this can refer to death right the long tricks over can refer to the duty on the steering wheel being over but also to the journey of life being over well um just to add something concerning the reflection of life this is obviously a subcurrent it's of meaning it's not that obvious but you sense it and it reinforces identification because we all go through these stages and now the depiction of the writing process so the poem is called sea fever so there's a sense of agitation and a sense of vision here I must down to the seas again and this anaphora opens all the stanzas the poet doesn't even take the time with the poetic persona doesn't even take the time to say go right I must down to the seas again I must down to the seas again I must down to the seas again that that's my idea that's what I'm going to write about right and it's repeated constantly we should note that he never goes to the sea it's only about the imagination it's not about actually going down there and uh, that probably relates to Maysfield's life because he was prone to seasickness all his life and uh, he was so fond of the sea and so fond of writing about it at the same time he couldn't really bear being on a ship because he became so seasick so that was a conflict he he had all his life and then we have the anaphora and and all i ask is a torship and the wheels kick and the wind song and white sail shaking and a gray mess on the sea's face and a gray dawn breaking and so on this and is constantly repeated and you get the sense of a frantic imagination a feverish kind of vision all these uh, ideas piling up piling up in the mind of the writer and so there's the sense of a fever a feverish kind of imagination at work and then we have and and this and is also a polysyndeton it's at the beginning of the line uh, in that case it's an anaphora but it's also a polysyndeton in many cases so a uh, conjunction which you do not necessarily need you can leave it out but it's it's inserted in order to to stress these ideas piling up right and then we have in the second last line we have the merry yarn evoked so this is actually a hint at the creation of a text right so it's quite actually quite explicit so once this feverish creation process is over you have the yarn you have the text and at the end you have quiet sleep and a sweet dream so once the text is written you can lean back and you can sleep quietly again after this feverish activity and what you imagined can nourish your dreams and you have sweet dreams on account of this fruitful process which has come to an end and uh, which which has been successful then it can 
feed sweet dreams. And then we have this when the long trick's over. So this can simply mean when the poem is over because trick can mean an illusion. So a poem is nothing real. He doesn't go down to the sea. He just writes about the sea and imagines it. Everything he says is purely in his imagination. And the word trick can also refer to the skill of the poet, right? You need to know tricks, you need to know your craft in order to write. So that can refer to the poet's craft, the poet's abilities and skills. Now in this poem, uh, you find a lot of features of Romanticism, despite its rather late publication date, and can be considered a late Romantic poem. I marked all the features of Romanticism. There are very, very many, as you can see. I'll enumerate them now. So, the poem revolves around the sea, which is a core symbol of Romanticism, because it stands for freedom and untamed wilderness. It's wide, it has no limits. It's the widest space you can you can find on Earth, right? There, there are no fences, no walls, nothing to restrict you. The sea is just open and man cannot dominate it. He can't build anything on it and it's, it's untamed. Then we have the romantic notion of loneliness. And so the speaker confronts nature on his own. And so he's on his own on this sailing ship, more or less at the mercy of the waves. And... Obviously, in Maysfield's time, uh, there were steam steamers, right? So, steamships. But he insists upon depicting a sailing ship. So, obviously, this kind of ship is much more prone to all kinds of accidents or... He, uh, at least on a sailing ship, you sense and feel nature, and the waves, the winds, much more than on a steaming ship because it's much more vulnerable, right, a, s a sailing ship. And it's also stated that the sea is lonely in the very first line. So this loneliness, we have the, the lonely poetic persona, I must down to the seas again, and all I ask and so on. There's no companion evoked at the beginning at all, not in the second stanza either. It's only in the very last stanza, in the second last line, that we find companions, but that's nearly at the end of the experience, right? At the beginning we have the lonely sailor and the lonely sea. And then we have freedom and boundlessness. So we have, as I already said, no human roads or anything, but we have a whale's way. So that suggests or highlights that it's only the sea animals uh, which actually have a way here, a path, whereas human beings have not. They are aliens in a way to this element. Then we have a yearning for untamed nature, so yearning for the sea, the wind, and we have a simile like a wetted knife. So he wants a strong wind, not just a, a slight wind, and he wants a stormy sea. Then we have a sense of unity with nature, which I already mentioned in connection with the personification of the sea. And then we have the romantic notion of wanderlust. And so he wants to go to the sea, which he never does, but he wants to go there. And he reiterates this in every first line of every stanza, I must down to the seas again. So there's this notion of I, I must I must go there, right? And then we have the evocation of gypsy life. So again, this topic of wanderlust there. And the fellow rover. So roving is obviously a movement, right, from one place to the other.
And then we have a celebration of the writing process and of the imagination. That is very romantic, and that uh, the romantic movement cherished the poet as a particularly sensitive person yeah, wh wh whose imagination surpasses the ordinary imagination and who manages to create all, all kinds of strong images just out of the blue, as it were, right? And then we have a, a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. That's a crucial notion of romanticism as well. The poetic persona is overwhelmed by the images triggered in his own mind. So uh, he's overwhelmed by this at the same time. So he sees all these images conjured up in his head uh, at very, very short intervals, and at the same time they overwhelm him. It's always this and, 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 his uh, feverish kind of imagination, and it, it overpowers him, this, these images pouring out, as it were. Right, that was my presentation of this poem, Sea Fever, and to bid you farewell, I'm going to play Edward Elgar's Dream Children again. Goodbye, and see you at the next video.